2021. Uh, and you can also interact via various apps you've been told you can do so. You can, after this session, you can go meet each other, uh, particularly at the Leiterman where there's food and beverage. Uh, and just enjoy yourselves and meet each other uh, in face to face for the audience that's here. For the virtual and global audience, hello and welcome back to this afternoon's sessions. Uh, today we're going to talk about a sort of interesting experiment, which is um, we've asked whether a monkey can uh, can write Shakespeare. Now the question is, can AI write poetry? Well, this is being tried out uh, at uh, the UK Expo in Dubai. Uh, in the, with the UK Pavilion. And to discuss this and wider matters regarding poetry and artificial intelligence, I'm going to hand you over to Guy Gadney, who's the CEO of Charisma.ai, and he will introduce the amazing panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Great to see you here in the Everyman uh, Cinema Theatre in uh, King's Cross. Great to see you around the world uh, on YouTube. And thanks so much to COGEX for having us here today. Um, my name is Guy Gadney. I run a company called Charisma.ai, which is around um, combining AI and storytelling. And I think you know that's a that's a sort of fascinating way uh, that we can start to introduce this around creativity and and, and AI. So, uh, firstly, uh, to kick off the session, I've got my notes. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Steve Austin Brown, who's CEO uh, of Avant Garde. Um, Not quite CEO. Creative CEO, director. creative director. Maybe next year. Well, I, it, there you go. It's, it's a future. It's a future-looking festival, isn't I hope it? He's so not I, listening. <laughs> um, which is a global experience agency uh, whose mission is to simplify bringing to life uh, stories for brands as participatory experiences. And in this case, what is interesting today is that these brands can uh, be nations. So, Steve, let me uh, pass over to you first and tell us a little bit more about what you're doing um, for the UK Pavilion. Thank you, Guy. Um, yeah, I thought it would be useful uh, without uh, going into too many uh, slides, but just to give you a bit of an intro, as this is about an actual project, so rather than just deep dive straight into a discussion, maybe a bit of context. Uh, and there I am waiting for the next slide when I can do it myself. Um, so the UK Pavilion has been a bit delayed. It was due to open uh, last October um, and is opening this October. And this is what we're talking about. And really, it's what's happening on that giant 20 meter high facade uh, that is of particular interest. But before going into that, give you a little bit of context. Um, expos have really been going for oh, over 150 years now. So the first one uh, is all due to us uh, in the UK with the Great Exhibition 1851. Uh, and that really was a vast collection uh, of things. So it was the works of industry of all nations. Uh, and that was really a celebration of what everyone across the world was doing. And what's interesting, although things have changed, um, one of the most recent UK pavilions uh, was Thomas Heatherwick's uh, Seed Cathedral. And there you go, that, that is a collection of a vast number of things. They're, they're all one thing, a seed, but there are 250,000 different ones from around the world. So really, from the beginnings, there is that continuity. Um, but very soon uh, into the 20th century, things began to change. So rather than just collections of things, um, people were interested and nations were interested in telling stories. So they were much more interested in uh, expressing things that had uh, a big impact for the globe. Uh, and so even as early as uh, 58 in Brussels, uh, you'll probably recognize this, the Atomium, uh, was basically telling the story without the thing. There's not much point in showing someone an atom. Um, so actually building it and immersing people in the story of the atom. Um, and then shooting back forward to the last of the expos uh, in Milan, um, the UK actually did something not dissimilar. They represented, maybe in a more abstract fashion, uh, they represented uh, a hive uh, community, a uh, colony of bees that enabled you as the visitor to feel what it was like to be in uh, that colony. And actually everything around you was live connected and responsive in terms of lighting and sound to a colony actually sitting in, uh, in the UK. So you can see the, the similarities. We're, we're still playing those same games. Um, really now, what's different is technology uh, is allowing us not to just immerse and storytell, but something that Avant-Garde's been really keen 
uh, to explore, and hopefully that's why we got awarded um, uh, the project, is is that we're more interested in story doing. So we're more interested in the people, the visitors, actually making a difference, changing, participating, and contributing to the actual um, experience. Um, so that brings us to really the story, that big, big briefs, uh, lots of uh, ambition at the very front end. And very simply, um, we all focused um, with the Department of international trade on the breakthrough message by Stephen Hawkins. So this was our kind of trigger um, and the inspiration for what we were doing. And it's basically, if we succeed in discovering another civilization, what, if anything, should we say to them about humanity and our planet Earth? And that sentiment really triggered well with the Expo's ambitions. Um, and so we really looked to work out exactly if that's the case, how can we use technology uh, to actually allow everyone, whether visiting the expo or even remotely, to take part and contribute to perhaps a collective message uh, from humanity that we will uh, beam out to space. Um, we partnered uh, with Es Devlin, um, who is a designer you may be aware of, but someone who's both an artist and a designer and someone who's fascinated in bringing uh, stories alive to bring them in a fully immersive way uh, to vast and disparate and very diverse audiences from rock to theatre and everything in between. Uh, she also has a strand of artwork uh, and really uses innovation to, surprisingly enough, connect and involve audiences. So what a brilliant uh, person to actually uh, look at how we might move this forward. And it's a very short vi little video here. Poem Portraits invites everyone to contribute, to donate a word to a collective poem. Chaos. Unequal. Complex. Ascending. The poem is generated by means of an algorithm that's trained on 20 million words of 19th century poetry. So each word that you add to it will combine with words that have been added by others and with the words of those who were writing a few centuries ago. Recollections of the binding sky, art thou alone? AI is basically another part of the team. It's another thing we're collaborating with. So that's actually a project, uh, actually a couple of projects before we began working together on the Expo project. And it's just basically the ambition has got bigger and uh, Judith um, will share some of that uh, ambition that really has led to not 19th century, but contemporary uh, and much more sophisticated um, kind of efforts at creating poetry. Lastly, this, this video um, was launched um, in March for World Poetry Day, but just gives a, a little idea of the next step, if you like. The start point is a new algorithm that's been built by a team of AI and poetry experts put together by the UK for Expo 2020 Dubai. By feeding the AI with 15,000 poems written by more than 100 British poets, the team has trained the AI how to read, understand and write poetry. So when members of the public type in a single word, the AI draws on its knowledge of poetic structures and forms to generate new, unique couplets that will link together to create one collective message that will be projected onto the facade of the UK Pavilion at Expo 2020 Dubai, sending a message of humanity to the world and reimagining the relationship between human and machine. So. If you had one word to say, what would it be to describe our planet and humanity? Oh, nice cut. <laughs> um, and really just to end and then to, to, to discuss it further, this was a, a conversation I had with one of the lead um, developers um, not too long ago. Uh, well, actually, it was when, when we were right in the midst of it all. And it, it really brought together the collaboration and the experimentation side. So we've got a huge team of experts on the algorithm side and teams of experts on the poetry side. And we're all coming together. This has never existed before. No one has done this. We're really doing something new here. So hopefully that introduces what the new is.
Perfect. Thanks, Steve, uh, for that introduction. And now the perfect segue, of course, to, uh, for me to be able to introduce Judith Palmer, who is the CEO of the Poetry Society. I am. Uh, <laughs> perfect. Uh, one of Britain's most dynamic arts institutions. Um, there are over 5,000 members worldwide. And, uh, and also it's been publishing the leading poetry magazine, the Poetry Review, which is now 110 years old. Mm -hmm. So uh, well-versed, pardon the pun, in this brilliantly. Uh, Judith, how did you get involved in this? And do you want to tell us a little bit more about, how, uh, about the project from your standpoint? Yeah, well, it was one of those um, random times you answer the phone and, uh, you know, people are always asking you, do you want to do this, do you want to do that? And most of them never go anywhere. We thought we usually follow them up. We always like to get involved in things. And uh, so the question was, would we like to come and help train the AI? Um, and as an organisation, we're big into education and, um, and participation. And so having a new pupil to get writing um, was a good, a good thing for us. So uh, yeah, we came along without knowing really what to expect. And uh, so the first thing we were doing was trying to add to the, uh, the database of poems that the AI had had to begin with, which was very much a kind of um, a 19th century collection. And um, so, the, the, so we, we sort of fed it copies and copies of our, our magazine. Uh, and uh, poems from our national poetry competition, which gets about 18,000 poems a year from all over the world, and our Foyle Young Poets of the Year Award, which is for teenage poets. So we were, tr we were trying to also make sure there were young voices in there, and to get that, and it's also a very diverse group of poets who take part in that. So new vocabulary, new forms, but generally, you know, bringing it a bit more up to date. And how was the experience? working in, in this tech area? Was it something new for you, new for the poets that were involved in it? Well, yes and no. I mean, you know, so I've, I've just put this this quote up here. I mean, because, you know, it won't come as any surprise that, you know, the aleatory principle in poetry of chance, of found poetry, of cut-ups, is nothing new. You know, so Tristan Zara um, wrote this manifesto in 1920 of how to make a Dadaist poet poem and it's not really that different you know take a newspaper take a pair of scissors you know stick the words in a bag come out with a poem so actually there's been lots and lots of experiments over the years um, and I'm always interested to see how they are continuing to develop. Steve what drew you to poetry in this? I mean, obviously, you're, you're putting together a huge exhibition. By the way, you should also please introduce this nice uh, stage thing. prop we have here yes, to begin yes. with. Yes, do it? feel free at the end to um, check it out. But yes, I mean, you've seen the pictures. It's not the actual thing. We've made it a bit bigger out in Dubai. But um, yeah, gives you a bit of idea on the scale. Um, poetry, I mean, it, it, very much the very first conversations with, with Ez Devlin and her team she's she's drawn to that um i think it's it's because of the freedom and we we were talking about this earlier mm. the freedom that poetry has for interpretation mm. uh rather than the the purest kind of prose form which is very kind of accurate and uh, doesn't allow that interpretation and uh, that leads to all kinds of exciting uh issues when it's a poem on the behalf of a a country but um, that was really the, 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 the poetry and, and again the history of uh, generative poetry um, so it's not brand new it, it, there is a history of artists and poets using it um, which is a bit different to cut up in a way is that the, the generative process of, uh, no, of developing it absolutely though I think that you know those cut up principles that then will mm. have fed those first experiments that people have been making really since the 60s of trying to to mechanize the process um, and I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. I remember there's, um, there's a fantastic uh, Indian novelist called Vikram Chandra who's written a couple of books about um, the links between poetry and, um, and coding. He was, a, he, he was a coder to get him to sort of get his way through university and was always m making these links that, that actually the programmers, if they learnt Sanskrit poetry, could learn how to code well because there's something to do with trying to perfect a language, finding the rules, breaking it down, um, and there are all these. Um, uh, so in in Sanskrit, 
uh, grammar. You know, there's these, these things about this is how you can create a perfect poem. You know, these, the vowels, do them in this order, have this number of syllables, uh, move them around like this. So there's a kind of, there's, a, there's an ongoing link. This is sort of 500 years BC. So, you know, sort of people have been trying to crack this. What is a perfect poem and can you make it happen through some sort of systematic activity that's been going on for a long time. And what you're alluding to there, which I find fascinating, is very AI, is the idea of iteration. So mm. just the way you described it was you, you started with poems yep. that were ingested into the, in, into the air, read by the AI, and then there was this process of iteration. Now, it sounds like that there were humans involved in that process of iteration as you went through and worked out what, what might be the poem that you actually wanted to see at the end. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. So the first thing we were sort of like, we were marking its homework and um, we were also sort of setting it some rules. So, so one of the problems with this is that it is to be a national project and be projected really, really, really big. And generally, if you're a student, you don't want your first attempts to be really, really big for everyone to see. And the trouble is, you know, sort of through an algorithm, some quite simple concepts um, would come up things like boys can never be girls. That isn't something we'd necessarily want to be standing by. So cons actually, the, so the first iterations were really about trying to say, what, what do we not want to see? And how do we make sure that it's not going to be embarrassing us. Um, and so the first, first iteration was, yeah, we had lots of couplets and we'd, we'd mark them. And the first rounds were really, really complicated. We had to say, was this how to, all the ways in which it could be improved. And then the systems got, got simpler. Um, and then we got involved, we got some poets involved um, to actually write some, um, some phrases as well and compare what the poets wrote to what the the AI wrote. But the, the problem was it's read all this poetry. And so it kept coming out with things like this, the membrane from my heart ripped out, the pulp out, the rib cage ripped. And again, it's like, please, no, <laughs> you know, really. <laughs> now, not that a poet would actually have probably written that, but it was kind of drawing on all this visceral, you know, energy that it was finding in all the poems. And it kept coming up with things like that. And, it, you know, could be prone to a bit of misogyny. I watched the woman with a feeling of regret for what has turned my life into a ruin. <laughs> um, so, and some of these, you can see that this isn't purely about a, being able to find a program of mm -hmm. saying, okay, well, you know, this is the grammatic structure, this is the form, this is the architecture you have to work with that within. It was much more about actually trying to teach it a tone, I suppose. That's so fascinating. And by the way, we're all in a room here together. So, you know, if you if you want to ask any questions, please do at any point, put up your hand. And well, Yes, already, so straight away. Uh, I think we've got a roving mic uh, as well, just so that we can... Um, I think it's for our online audience as well, just so that they can get it. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Christian de Vartovan. I'm a consultant in AI and and blockchain. But also, I have a passion for poetry for various reasons. We could get into that. But I want to ask you a question. So if I understand well, this is about the form, about the beauty of the form, not the, what has been lived as a person, as a poet. Because, of course, the machine hasn't had a human experience. So you're concentrating on what can come out, what, what can, could come out of some algorithm, accidental, uh, you know, trial or experiment, is that right? Or are you considering that the AI could have some lived, uh, some human sort of experience? So at this point, it has just, it hasn't lived itself, but like my nine-year-old self, I hadn't lived much, but I had read a lot. Yeah. You know, so I had lived my life through reading, 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 reading. And so it's kind of like it's a bookworm personality who hasn't been out much, but they have read quite a lot. Steve, what do and, you think? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, the, I think it's the trigger, um, I think it, the seed uh, or the donated word, which is, if you like, that, that's the emotion, that's the human start point. So every, every couplet, every 
second line um, is is driven by that word. So that word is, if you like, the the emotion, uh, the humanity. Now, yes, then the machine, I guess, uh, and you you know more about the the systems, but it, it's looking for patterns. So it's looking for how that word has been used in its fast reading. So are you looking for the words to stimulate subconsciously something in the person that reads the words that the machine has created, or the, the assemblage of words? That uh, is, are you it, working it, at the subconscious yeah, level? Yeah, it's, it, well, it's a two-way. The, the, the whole thing is instigated by a visitor who's inspired by the, the exhibition that runs up and down the sides of our giant cone that holds the poem. Um, so through that exploration of uh, humanity, all the innovations that we're looking at, we're hoping that a word leaps out. So that word then is the start point of the poem. And every six seconds, a new word, a new word, a new word. And this algorithm is working way faster than a poet could in, in giving a framework. And it's not only matching that word with two lines of verse, it's connecting that two lines to the next two, to the next two. So there's a very sophisticated... Uh, pattern sequence that it's developing. Now, you're, you're right, is, is it emotion? Is it thinking? I mean, th this is the whole thing about AI, isn't it? Um, so does it compare to the, you remember the psychiatric test once upon a time where you had some ink on a paper and what do you see? So could it be, I, I read these words, what is it that you feel or what do you understand? I, I hope that all, all mm -hmm. uh, poetry still works. It, yeah, whether how it's generated, yes. you right. still read it, you still impart your your kind of feeling and take on it. Because yeah. we've, we've kind of gradually, over the different iterations, we've got it to put the knives down, and, and it, towards the later iterations, it started showing love and was throwing up uh, nice couplets like this. I have a great bear to contend with. I'm sure he loves me. <laughs> uh, so, um, okay, maybe uh, where it's most successful is where it's still working in that area of the surreal, you know, which is the random juxtaposition but the success is that it kind of makes sense it's not just random followed by random followed by mm. random but that actually the random links to something else that's connected you know so um it is it is learning um and it is beginning to yeah show love yeah, it, is, it, it is interesting, I think we were talking about this a little bit before, about how the choice of poetry is so common, I mean, you know, prevalent at the moment on the basis that it is open to interpretation by humans. Whereas if you're trying to get AI to write a novel, which is much more rigorously structured and needs to have sort of more uh, sensical and, dare I say, soulful connections between all of those different things, it's a different challenge. But I do think it's all, the, the way in which this project was curated in some way was, I think, fascinating and, and how the human interest in it. And also, Judith, the way you, you, you had up there the, the, the Dadaist poem mm. that had, had, I mean, there was so many parallels with that. If you were to, if you were to, uh, I don't know whether you, whether it's possible to define an AI poem, if you could say this is a Dadaist poem, what is an AI poem stylistically? I wouldn't be able to say what an AI poem is, but because I mean, obviously it, it can only give you what it's had access to, you know? So there was a great one that was, was doing the rounds about 10 years ago where it could take your entire Twitter feed and create sonnets out of your most common um, phrases. And, and everybody enjoyed that and it was fun. Um, but it has been interesting to see how it has progressed. But the problem is, as you rightly point out, at the moment, fascinating as the experiment is, it's striving for the universal all the time, and it isn't quite able to reach into the, the really specific and subjective that makes us connect with a poem. It, it isn't full of people's names and places and that sense of yeah, brand names and all the things that come up in, in, in regular uh, poetry as people kind of, you know, often, you know, draw on memory and recollection. And it, it can't, it, at the moment, it can't quite do that. And it's, it's too universal and it's trying not to offend. And that is not very poety. <laughs> But that, that was the brief, though, wasn't the, it? Uh, like, yeah, absolutely. So an AI yeah. um, poem is a polite poem, I would say. Um, so that's good to know, isn't it? Um, but it's having to avoid a lot 
And um, I, I flashed that one earlier, which, you know, sort of plane building crash, <laughs> you know, um, it, it's like the number of words that we had to block of so that it couldn't put these things together. It, it did find that it's, um, it's very comfortable in nature now. So again, it has sort of returned to sort of 19th century interests at, or 21st century eco poetry. It is very firmly, it's, it's very comfortable actually when it's either in the cosmos or when it is dealing with weather systems and deserts and you know that kind of thing. So it's kind of, in that regard, it does connect with the, um, the Stephen Hawking's message to the universe. And it wasn't by us trying to specifically put it jam full, full of cosmic language and Gaian philosophy. It's just that when you stripped out all the subjective stuff, what you were left with was, you know, earth, sky, space. Mm. And Steve, uh, Stephen Hawking's message is quite soulful. You know, it's quite a strong provocation you had there. You've got this great exhibition coming up uh, later this year. What, what do you hope people feel if someone sort of goes there as a result of this experiment? So you define, mm. What do you hope people come away from it thinking and feeling about this particular piece? Interesting. I mean, luckily, it's going to be in a country that, that probably loves poetry e even more, maybe, than we yeah. do here. And we sure love it uh, here or master it. Um, so, it, I mean, when we presented the idea um, to um, the, the kind of organisers in, in Dubai, they were like, oh, poetry, you're doing poetry. Why didn't we think of that almost? It was like, so they were very happy to, to see this ever changing, you know, and every time you go there, what I'm excited about is that it will always be changing, the entire facade. Um, and it will change because of the mood and the topics of conversation. So if in Expo, um, we have, f the UK has a program, so it will talk about um, innovation in fashion, in travel, in, in food, in a variety of other areas. So each time that week is going, then ho I'm hoping the, the poem will suddenly flow into croissants and uh, pork chops. And uh, the, you get that kind of, if you read the whole thing, which you will be able to, because it will be stream, you know, you'll be able online to see this thing living and great. Now, you take a long time to read it, I think. But um, yeah, that's what I, I think the, the idea of it changing over time fascinates me. Same. And, and, and what's interesting, I, I think, in, in this panel is that we are very much on, on this side as, as well, in fact, all three of us in, 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 in a lot of ways are very creative, you know, I mean, creative director, we've got poetry, and we do a lot of this, this storytelling in our own space. How do you, how do you see this? How did you feel on the project that maybe AI was starting to encroach a little bit. I mean, it's the question that, mm. that, that many people, I suppose, are worried about because for many, you know, very strong, soulful and, and, and philosophical reasons. Did you, did you feel that there was a, um, any, any form of antagonism in there or anything people should be worried about? Or did you see it as a sort of new collaborator? Definitely a new collaborator, and uh, I mean, it's the, the old Bandersnatch thing, isn't it? I mean, the, I remember Minority Report was like, gave 15 years of VR, you know, moving hands around like this, and, and suddenly Bandersnatch comes out, and it's that using AI to create open-ended narratives and choose stories. Now, now, that's fascinating as a, a storyteller or a story doer, uh, as I should term myself, because that is the, the AI that excites me. I mean, there, uh, with every excitement, there's always a ethical or moral question. Like, we, we've created uh, virtual avatars who represent a brand, um, partly because it seems like a mad, crazy thing to do. But then you watch hundreds of people engage with them, uh, and you wonder what's going on. But I mean, AI really does open up a, 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 as a collaborator and not a leader it opens up loads of uh, opportunities for us. And I mean, for us, I think we found it, it's, it's really fun and it's great to be um, representing the UK with something that is essentially experimental and pretty risky because we don't know what it's gonna come up with. But 
um, when I was trying to get poets to be involved in some of the early stages, when I was trying to get it to write um, according to some of the seed words we were we were given, so like we were given, I was giving poets these six words that that's what we were given by the developer, and everybody had to write around those. Quite a few poets said, "I don't want to do this. Um, you know, the robots are coming for my job," and um, and although they were joking, they also weren't. They really, really. I said, "Okay." And now will you write me something? And they were like, no. <laughs> I'm like, no. Um, but I think I'd say that the, it's parallel paths. You know, I don't think it's uh, any time soon is it going to replace the poetry that's going to be written by humans. But it's able to do something that's really stimulating and engaging and might in itself be a useful tool for teaching poetry. Because you might, if you can learn the rules through it, because it, it has learnt quite a lot around not just about the way la um, words have recurred, but it's it's been very good at picking up patterns of repetition, and it's it be was beginning to get quite good at rhythm actually and metrical devices, and you could possibly get it to teach poets some of the formal stuff that um, you know the, some of the craft elements, I suppose. So we've got a couple of questions arising. I think just at the back there first two, three, four, uh, and see it suddenly kicks off. And, it, and it was, it's always around the moment where you start thinking about AI replacing humans. Uh, <laughs> just at the back, there's, just, is that right? I think, sorry, is that right? Hi, thank you. Um, I had two questions. One is just more uh, technical. When you say that the poem will be changing, is it going to be one poem per day during the expo? Um, can you just clarify exactly how it's going to pop up? And you, cause you mm -hmm. also mentioned every, I think, six seconds the word comes in. So just to understand exactly how it's going to come out. And then the second, um, which Judith, you kind of touched upon a little bit now, um, do you see a wider applicability of this um, process and technology um, beyond what you're doing now for the expo? Do you want to go first? Uh, uh, number one, yeah, uh, it, it's a little complicated, but no, it is one entire collective message or poem. So we, we will have one thing. Uh, it goes on even when visitors leave. It goes on through the night. Um, and the, the, sex, the six seconds is basically the fastest that it can um, develop the next couplet, the next two lines. So that's the speed that it's growing. Um, that was the also matched the number of people that would be going through uh, now whether covid uh, changes that and we can slightly chill out and it can get even have a bit more time to uh, think about each couplet but that yeah no it's one big thing that that has its seed every six seconds just adding iterative yeah and in terms of the um the future of it um i don't know but i'd really like us to be involved in seeing what it can do. But I could imagine certainly a collaborative process of kind of call and response, which again is a sort of very, you know, common poetry technique where you might have human poet two lines, AI two lines, and actually get a dialogue going. Because I think I think that's what it needs. It needs to have that um, that conversation. So it's having the seed words put in by visitors to the to the expo. So it's got it's got human input, so it's going to change thematically. But I think it needs to have, to develop it to the next stage, it needs to be having somebody who's engaging back and forth so that it can react and, you know, and then the human can react and then the AI can react. I think that's where it needs to go next. Thank you. Can we get the mic down again? Who was next? I think we were just here and then there. Just here. Row the three. Well. And then we've got one back there as well. Hi. Um, it wasn't really like a question, it was more of a response to what he was saying earlier. Um, and I was thinking how it was a bit more of a contradictory because you were saying it was not stemming from one a human experience. But then on one end, if you think about it, it was, I mean, in terms of quantity, it's like joining a span of, of like of different voices of like different cultures. And, and so it's almost more humanist because there's more individual humans being contributing to the same poem. And so it was more about, do you think that that makes it more of a human experience or less so? Is, is the AI, is it more, is it more like basically stemming from human experience or is it machine, the machine side of it taking over? I don't know, it was a bit of an observation. Great question. 
I mean, uh, I, I mean, the, it's interesting because I think you're you're hitting on the right thing because you could obviously it's learning and it is the bookworm side, so mm. it's learning about um, expressions of humanity from its very source material. So it's learning how humans have begun to talk and communicate about some pretty big big topics. And you're right again, the 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 words that are picked. I hope are good triggers rather than the and but and you know it, it, they will hopefully be words if we um, create the right inspiration for our audience they will be words that trigger an interesting response from the algorithm so it's got a bit of a, a double-sided human touch. I mean it was interesting I mean <laughs> sorry this is, is a bit random but it, I, it the AI used plasma more often than any other poet I've ever known. It was like it kept coming back to plasma. <laughs> and I, I've never actually seen plasma in a poem, though now I feel sure I'll, there'll be lots. But <laughs> uh, so it, it was beginning to, you know, it, it had its own sort of specialist focus. Um, but it's interesting, it, it, it did go through a learning process, but I think you saw that because it has read a lot of 19th century poetry, it still doesn't quite know that that's something you learn and you, inha it, you know, inhabit, but you don't necessarily, it, did, it was still towards the end coming up with things like a, stare, a star ere it faded. That's something new. And yeah, so I mean, it, it does have because you know, generally speaking, we still do get people who you know, we've got lots of people who are like, I don't like this modern poetry stuff, and he's like, yeah, the stuff that's been written since eighteen ninety. <laughs> um, and so actually, it might find that it's naturally got an awful lot more in common with um, with with a lot of people uh, who prefer their poetry, you know less um less up to date um but it can and it that it can mix those two so maybe that that sense of a sort of i, I think i like the echoingness you know if you think of those sort of um seti programs and things you know where you're beaming out to space and you're just sending something and you know who knows you know in how what millennia that little radio signal is going to reach somewhere the fact that it, it it's kind of delving back with these echoes of of kind of 150 years worth of of um of dialect is 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 interesting and mashing it up with with something more contemporary and and international because most of the visitors to the fair won't be mm. from the UK and so there'll be different Englishes and and all of that melting pot that hopefully is is there where a lot of the most interesting poetry comes from um that's not written by AI you know is through people who are experimenting with language and have different language traditions that they're bringing to bear. So hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll begin to show some of that fruit too. So. Mm. Mike, just over there. This is the last mm -hmm. question, is it? Okay. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hello. Uh, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you. So I'm, I'm loving this conversation. The, the, uh, the question I had was, to do with how can we how can we go even further? So look, um, I mean, uh, I I'm doing a bunch of things too on the side. Uh, I'm trying to run like multidimensional sentiment analysis to understand like the beating heart of a population, and to me that is like the the apotheosis of like human like collective feeling and emotion. And what you're doing is just incredible. But my my. My question to you is, what projects have you seen? What kind of technology exists out there which young artists can, or any artists, uh, but you know, uh, uh, artists can go in and actually engage with, like AI or other technology that we can actually use to enhance and amplify our technology, uh, our art, um, you know, which is like accessible. You might answer um, to that one. <laughs> uh, so from my experience, we do look at this a lot. And uh, I, I'm going to give you one very high level answer and then one very detailed one. The very high level one is it's vital that as new technology is being developed, creative people are involved in that design process. Because otherwise, you're going to get large tech organizations who are building stuff for their own purposes without realizing that 
that actually they're painting the new form of paintbrush or something. So that's, that's key. And then the more detailed standpoint is have a play around with games industry, I'd say. You know, there's, there was a bit of a polemic around AI Dungeon the other day as a, as a, as a game. Uh, powered by GPT-3, open hours technology, which was interesting. We're about to release a dream simulator in 3D, which is good fun. Uh, and I think, I think we're just getting, these are, these are new color palettes, they're new paintbrushes, they're new keyboards, they're new musical instruments. Uh, and I think I go back and say, it's, it's vital that the people we've got on stage here, the creatives are involved in that, rather than taking something and trying to retrofit it, retrofit a chatbot, you know, call center chatbot into a storyteller. that that doesn't seem right. So my answer would be, collectively, we need to involve the creative industries more. But um, an open source is king. Yeah, definitely. Wonderful. I think we're on time. Are we on time? Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, thank you. And thank you to the panel, Judith and Steve. Thank you. And a big, uh, big thank you from uh, COGX as well for a really uh, stimulating panel. and. Um, sort of mind-blowing at turn so thank you so much uh tweet as ever uh your simulation ai poetry or just your thoughts and comments to uh hashtag cogx2021 um on shortly on this space uh we're going to be having something from the economy strand it's going to be david mattin who's going to be giving um such a keynote speech on new world same humans his new book and it's three ideas uh, about how, how AI is going to fundamentally uh, serve human needs. So do join us in person here uh, at King's Cross Everyman at uh, ooh, five o'clock. Um, uh, but for now, have a good break, have a good coffee, have a wander around the site. And to our digital guests, our online guests, our worldwide guests, do please look around the other stages. There are lots of interesting things going on there too. Thank you for now. Thank you. Thank you.